It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here at the 92nd Street Y and to introduce one of the great jurists of this or any generation in American legal thought, Justice Stephen Breyer. I think you all know Justice Breyer's biography, but let me go through it briefly nevertheless. Born and raised in San Francisco, he was an Eagle Scout, a student at Stanford University. Then he went to Magdalen College, Oxford as a Marshall Scholar, from there to Harvard Law School, and from Harvard Law School to a clerkship with Justice Arthur Goldberg on the Supreme Court. Leaving the court, uh, then not yet Justice Breyer, uh, went and worked in the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. And from there, he went to Harvard University, where he rose to the ranks to become full professor of law. While he was at Harvard, Justice Breyer did something rather unusual for a professor, and that is he went off into the real world at a couple of crucial junctures. The first was in the Vietnam era, where he was an assistant special prosecutor, and then subsequently a special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee when it was engaged in the Wa Watergate investigations. Then again, after returning to Harvard, he went back to the Judiciary Committee in the latter part of the 1970s as chief counsel for that extremely influential committee. He was nominated by President Jimmy Carter to the US Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, confirmed in a remarkable bipartisan moment that now looks like a vestige of things past. <laughs> we could attribute it solely to the wonderful personality and legal genius of Justice Breyer, and that's the main explanation, but there are some other moving parts too. There used to be a thing called bipartisanship which occasionally manifested itself. And from there, Justice Breyer served on the US Court of Appeals with very great distinction until President Clinton nominated him to the US Supreme Court. As a professor, his two most influential books were both on the theory of regulation, the topic on which he was the acknowledged national leader. As a justice serving since 1994, Justice Breyer has added yet another remarkable book a book called Active Liberty, which I hope we'll have a chance to talk about tonight, which lays out his basic philosophy of constitutional thought and constitutional jurisprudence. You could say it came naturally to him since he had been writing books all along anyway. This is now his 20th year on the bench as a justice. That's itself an extraordinary fact. For a surprisingly large number of those years, he was the junior justice on the court. He almost broke the record for longest serving junior justice. That is the justice after whom no one was elected for the longest time, but that record is still held by his predecessor as a Harvard Law School professor and Supreme Court Justice, uh, Justice Joseph Story. On the bench, Justice Breyer's approach has been very much as laid out in his work, pragmatic, carefully reasoned, nuanced, sensitive to the felt realities of the time, and he is also, as you are about to discover, an extraordinary interlocutor and raconteur it's a great, great pleasure to welcome Justice Stephen Breyer. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, Justice Breyer. Thank you for being here very much. Thank you. I thought a good place to begin would be with a comment that Susan made that must be on the minds of many people in the audience. And that is the implication, Susan implied it, that the business of the court, especially the high profile business with which we're all familiar, has a political cast to it. Would you say what you think about that formulation? The idea that the court's most important cases, not the ones on which you all agree 9-0 and there's no great trouble, or the ones in which you split along idiosyncratic lines connected to your particular jurisprudential approaches, but the big ticket cases, the ones that I can't ask about if they're pending, um, but which nevertheless uh, are very much on our minds, to say that those have a political cast. What do you, what do you make of that formulation? Well, I'm thinking of an answer. <laughs> I would like to thank the Y for having me here. Last time they invited me, we got to see a movie. It was a great movie. <laughs> Who shot Liberty Valance? Fabulous movie. I'm afraid this is going to be about law. And I want to thank you for the introduction. You, you, you only left out one thing. You know what you left out when you were talking about my, my books on administrative law? The, uh, for some reason, I don't understand how this happened, but the LA Times got hold of one of these books and actually wrote a review of this administrative <laughs> law book in the LA Times. Oh, those were the days. Yeah, yeah, right. Those were the days. Here's how it started. It said, in Alice in Wonderland, Alice comes out of the pool of tears with the dormouse 
and the Dormouse sits on a mushroom or something and begins to read from Hume's History of England. Why are you reading that? said Alice. Well, says the Dormouse, uh, because we're wet and this is the driest thing I know. <laughs> that was before Breyer wrote this book. <laughs> <laughs> I think, case, I think Hume's <laughs> History of England is a real page turner. I don't yeah, know what they're talking about. Probably it is. No. I don't know. I'm, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> and so is administrative law. But nonetheless, <laughs> the, 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 you, you want to know about the, uh, I, I do get this question quite often. Uh, aren't you really a group of, you were polite. Uh, usually it's put by a student or a law student. You're really just a group of junior varsity politicians, aren't you? No, I said that would be unfortunate. Because uh, one thing, judges may think they know something about politics, but they're pretty bad at it. See Roger Taney and Dred Scott. <laughs> I mean, they've never been very good at it. I mean, the reason I say that is I think the only basis for Dred Scott anyone's been able to dredge up was that Taney thought somehow by writing that opinion, which is certain, goes to the bottom of the list or the top of the bad list, uh, he would stop the Civil War. Well, if anything, he helped start the Civil War. And I said, that is a normal political view for a judge, 180 degrees wrong. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I hope it's not true. Uh, but uh, in what sense is there something to that and in what sense isn't? I said, well, I, I did work for Senator Kennedy for two or three years when he was uh, 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 chairman of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. So when you say politics, I think politics. <laughs> Politics for us, when I was working on the Senate staff, meant where are the votes? Uh, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And who's popular? And which party is going to be more popular as a result of this? And that, I haven't seen. That party sense of politics, no. Now you'd say, well, what about uh, um, Bush v. Gore? I think I could convince you of that. I'd need an hour, but nonetheless, I think I could convince you. <laughs> we won't give you the hour, sorry. Right, so anyway. But uh, you'd have to say very rarely, and I'd say, no, I don't see it. Not in that sense. Well, you see, you didn't really... Not in the partisan sense. You, 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 well, that's what politics is about. But you say, no, you mean the Madisonian sense. He's writing the de definitive work on this subject, and, and uh, well, he knows... that it. remains to be seen. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but, 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 you mean in the sense, let's try, ideological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you a... Um, Adam Smith free enterpriser. Are you a Marxist troublemaker? Uh, well, you see, if I think I'm writing an opinion and that's what's moving me, I better think again. I know I'm doing the wrong thing. And uh, my colleagues feel the same. Uh, well, there is a sense, though, in which I can sort of see what you mean. Uh, I mean, each of us is who he or she is. I was born in San Francisco. My family's from San Francisco. I went to Lowell High School. I uh, grew up in the 50s. I uh, went to Stanford. Uh, I've had the life I've had. And each of us, uh, at a certain period, has views of a certain kind, uh, rather philosophical views about the profession that we're in. Now, you can't take those out of people, and I, I don't think you should. You can't. They're just part of me, and they're part of you, and they're part of everybody. Now, in that sense, they can be different one from the other. And does that have an influence? Yeah, it does. I but, think. Justice, aren't those also correlated occasionally with political issues? So take, for example, a very pressing issue mm -hmm. on which you've written extensively, statutory interpretation. And you've advanced, and I hope I'll have a chance to talk more with you about it tonight, a very convincing, to my mind, and powerful argument for looking at the purpose of statutes mm -hmm. in the process of interpretation. Justice Scalia, just because he's written an academic book about it, as well as writing many opinions about it, takes the other view, uh, focuses on the text, and purports not to be interested in the purpose, although you, you say that he does care about the purpose, Sometimes. but he denies it. Yet, if you look at the court, the vast majority of the justices who share your views are Democratic appointees, and the vast majority of those who share his views are Republican appointees. So how can one explain that correlation without thinking at least a little bit? John Stevens was not a Democratic appointee, and he shared my views. He was a Republican appointee. And your former boss, David Souter, was a Republican appointee, and he approached statutes the same way. Republicans used to be a little different than they are now, though, surely. I mean, they, you had a Ford appointment and a George H.W. Bush appointment. 
times change too. But uh, lots of things change. But there's nothing particularly Republican or Democrat or even liberal or conservative about uh, paying more attention to purposes. Uh, now, wait, I've lost track of something that is important um, that helps better than this uh, explain what I'm trying, to, what you're driving at. Uh, presidents, let me put it this way. Uh, I came from San Francisco. I lived for a long time in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I did meet a lot of people who disagreed with a lot of things I said, but I didn't know the meaning of disagreement until I came to Washington. Uh, then I saw people who really disagreed at, with me. <laughs> you know, it's like Tolstoy. What's the nerve? <laughs> yeah, the nerve, exactly. Me who everybody loves. How can they do this to me? I mean, this is, right, right. That's exactly. That's exactly. First reaction. Second reaction, wait. It's a big country. There are 310 million people. They think different things. My mother used to say that. She used to say there's every race, every religion, and every point of view. As she put it, there is no view so crazy there isn't somebody in this country who doesn't hold it. And uh, <laughs> we're from San Francisco. She said they all live in Los Angeles. But, but uh, <laughs> still, you see the point. And it's not such a terrible thing, I came to th accept, that not everybody does agree with me all the time. Why should they? I mean, they're terribly open words. The word liberty doesn't explain itself, nor do the words the freedom of speech. Now, what happens, as you well know, you've written about it, over long periods of time, the court can gradually change in terms of basic philosophical outlook. Because presidents, while they might have one or two appointments, don't usually have more. You know, when I grew up, I thought the Supreme Court was supposed to be appointed by Democrats, namely Roosevelt and Truman. But that was a, just a chance happening of history. Normally, it's presidents of different parties over long periods of time. Presidents will try to appoint judges who agree with them, not because they're president, but the, they try to appoint people who have the same philosophical outlook. If they think, by the way, that they're going to get decisions in their favor all the time, they're certainly wrong. I mean, my goodness, uh, Roosevelt appointed Holmes within six months, Teddy Roosevelt. Within six months, Holmes is dissenting in Northern Securities, a major antitrust case. He's on the wrong side, according to Roosevelt. Roosevelt says, I could appoint a judge with more backbone carved out of a banana. <laughs> he was pretty annoyed. And, but he should not have expected, indeed, if he had a sense, the most he could expect is a judge who sincerely believes that the law is somewhat like, in terms of basic underpinnings, uh, something vaguely like what that president thinks. And there he's more likely to be successful, not all the time. Especially Indeed, in a contemporary world where the right. vetting process is much more detailed than it was at that time. You think there he's was, more successful? I think contemporary Maybe. presidents are probably know. likely to be more successful because they know a lot more, mm. and there are more people who think about this and keep a careful eye on the candidates. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I'm not the appointing authority. I am the appointed authority. <laughs> and I would say, and I say this a lot, that ask me about the appointments process is asking for the recipe of chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. <laughs> so. I don't know what goes through a president's mind. But you see but the after effect. That you see the after effect, correct. though. You're and working the after day effect in and day out. Is, of, is of different points of view on certain basic questions. But the way I look at it is there are some words. In this document, the Constitution, or. You just happen to have one here? I do. I, carry, I put them in my pocket because God only knows somebody's going to ask me a question, you know, like, what's the tonnage clause? <laughs> and, and I have no idea, but I can look it up. Because as an index, has anyone ever asked you that? Yes, yes, they ha I had to write a case on it. You don't know that. You're no, a I law know. professor. I, I know, but you the don't case. know my case. But I didn't think a random <laughs> person in the audience would ask you about the tonnage clause. No, you never know. But I certainly don't teach it. You see, anyway, it helps to carry it around. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, there is in fact always a text, and it can be in a statute or here, and judges tend to approach the interpretation of those words. Similarly, what? They only have five tools. They look at the words. They read them. They matter. The text. Then there's the history. Then there is tradition. Tradition being like 
Uh, habeas corpus has a tradition. Uh, res ipsa loquitur has a tradition. Tradition. And the purpose, the value or the purpose. Okay, what, uh, uh, and the consequences, but consequences evaluated in terms of purpose or value. In other words, if you're reading the Fourth Amendment, you're probably more interested in privacy-related consequences. The First Amendment, probably expression-related consequences. Everybody has those five things, the text, the history, the tradition, the, uh, the purpose or value, and the consequences. Now some people emphasize, all of them, everybody uses all five sometimes, sure. but some people emphasize more the first three, that's Justice Scalia, you know, text, history, and some people emphasize last two. Probably that's me. So there are those differences. Those differences explain a lot more than whether you were appointed by a Republican or a Democrat. But you agree that they could be indexed with that because of the president's selection of someone, a justice, who might emphasize the last two as opposed to the first three. That's true. So then they, you, that would make some explanation of why the public sees it in partisan terms. Well, there's several explanations. I mean, I, one explanation, I mean, far be it from me to say at a Bloomberg-sponsored conference. But <laughs> probably I know what you're few, about to say, but it'll be yes, something good, yeah. No, we're not necessarily, but <laughs> few people realize that you know, but not everyone does, last year half of our opinions were unanimous. Uh, the number of five fours, I think, was about 20 percent, maybe 10 opinions. Not always the same five or the same four. And you say, how many were the sort of lineup that you've come to expect? Maybe six. That's a pretty small number out of 70. But, 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 you were about to say, those are the most important. I'll say, well, perhaps. I don't necessarily think so. Uh, in fact, I do think they're the ones that are the most newsworthy, which is a different matter, a different matter probably one of the most important opinions written in, this, uh, in, the, la in the 20th century was Erie versus Tompkins. Mm -hmm. Justice Frankfurter phoned up the newspapers <laughs> and said, we've written the most important opinion in the century. He didn't, didn't say it quite like that, but he, he said, why haven't you like written that. this? Yeah. Why haven't you written about it? It wasn't newsworthy. So, so I will say this newsworthy, yes, and you see uh, uh, those will uh, break down how? By politics? No, I don't think so. I think they're more likely to break down by the factors that I've mentioned. Can I ask you then about, about one of those factors, the question yeah. of purpose in particular? Recently, the Supreme Court got some attention for what was otherwise a very minor case, the Yates case, raising the question of whether a fish was a tangible object. Yes. Um, that catches people's attention. It catches people's attention. Surprise, and surprise. Justice Kagan in her dissent quoted Dr. Seuss, and that was good for a, a few headlines. You were in the decision, the, the opinion for four justices, which then became the plurality because of a concurrence by Justice Alito, and the emphasis seems to have been primarily on the purpose of the statute, which was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. That's right. um, the dissenters uh, focused more directly on the text. Um, first, I guess the way to ask the question is, is a fish a tangible object? And if it isn't, as the court said that it wasn't, why isn't a fish a tangible object? It's invisible. Is it an invisible fish? Yes. No, it's not a tangible. Well, if you could feel it, even I, if it were invisible, no, it would sorry. still be tangible. I, I explain. Forget that. It's a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the fact is that you do normally interpret words in context. And so the five or the four and a half who thought uh, that the context mattered said the other words nearby and the purpose of this statute is primarily to deal with documentary evidence, for example. Uh, something that might come into court, and a fish is so rarely likely to come in that, that it's uh, uh, an outlier there. Th these are the kinds of normal statutory questions. That's interesting and slightly funny because it concerned a fish. And for some reason, people think fish are funny. And I, I, I and, don't know. And because that they think the statutory purpose is a topic of very great importance in the contemporary legal scene, Absolutely. one might say. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. A, a typical case, which I will frequently use if, because uh, I saw this, I mean, this, this, there's, there's so many that, th to give you an idea of what, it, what is it like to interpret a statute, I don't want to discourage you, but, but uh, I saw an article in a French newspaper, I couldn't resist cutting it out to use for teaching purposes, really, a, 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 a uh, biology professor is on the train going from Nantes to Paris where his class is meeting and he has a basket and in the basket are 20 snails, 20 live snails. 
So the conductor says, what's in the basket? So he shows him. He says, that's okay, but you have to pay a ticket for the snails. You have to buy a ticket. He says, I have to buy a ticket for the snails? He says, that's ridiculous. I mean, I'll pay for my own ticket, but snails? He says, yes, read the book. Here is the tariff. It says, no animals on the train unless they're in a basket, in which case you have to buy a ticket. He said, they don't mean snails. They mean cats or dogs, not snails. The conductor says, is a snail an animal or not? Well, there we are. And I say, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> is it true? Yes, no, no question yeah. about there it. There we are. Do we look, what, why did they write you know, that purpose, or do you look just at the text and so forth? Well, we'll come back to, to France, I hope, in yeah. a few moments. So in addition to the purpose side of things, you mentioned consequences as the other one of the focuses yes. in, in your work. And I want to ask you about two very interesting and important opinions that you've written that are related to consequences. The first goes back a little bit in history to the case called Clinton against Jones. You may remember a person named Clinton. He was president of the United States and you remember an, another person called Paula Jones. In that case, there was an, uh, an opinion with eight justices signing on to it that said, and I'm paraphrasing, the president can be sued while he's in office in a civil matter, and we're not terribly worried about the practical consequences of that. Then there's an opinion signed by Stephen G. Breyer that's in the US reports labeled as a concurrence that says, I'm not so sure. Things may be more complicated than that, but that goes along with the majority with respect to the formal conclusion, the technical conclusion of the case. I want to ask you about that opinion and not only about what you said there, but if you would do things differently today. I don't think I'd write it differently. I mean, would I label it a dissent? Yes, that's a relevant question. That is a relevant question. Of course, I don't know. Uh, the, 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 the kind of issue uh, that you're uh, talking about, I mean, there's the President of the United States and maybe there's a virtue in unanimity or appearance of unanimity if you write what you think, but I mean, th let me show you how internally, psychologically, this kind of problem really does come up. I used to, when I was in your shoes, basically, go around saying, you know, it's just terrible that the Supreme Court doesn't always have at least five people on one opinion. I mean, it's not about them personally. Uh, th there isn't a constitution according to me or according to Sandra O'Connor or David Sood or anyone else. There is a constitution. And the public, and particularly the lawyers and the judges who work with these things, need to know what the law is. We wear black robes because we symbolize law speaking through the judges. That's a myth, but there is something to it. Mm -hmm. And that something to it is, is important. So why? Do you not get five people on at least get five on one opinion? I say, I know why. It's called ego. It's just ego. It's too hard for people to submerge their own point of view in order to sign an opinion that they're not perfectly happy with because that will destroy their, say their, 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 their perfect analysis of it. I said, that's terrible, terrible. They shouldn't do it. And I, I would say, then I became a member of the court. Within two years, we have a case involving whether the First Amendment forbids Congress from telling a, ca uh, uh, a cable broadcaster that he has to carry over-the-air stations. Now, four people thought that Congress can do that because there's an antitrust problem that they're trying to cure and therefore it's legitimate. Four people thought there is no antitrust problem, and so Congress can't do it because it affects speech rights. One person thought there is no antitrust problem, but Congress can do it anyway. <laughs> Guess who? And so I think, well, shouldn't I join the majority? I can't. I've taught antitrust for 14 years. How can I possibly say there's an antitrust problem when there isn't? You say, I can't. Well, there we are. But four, there, four, one. But their justice, uh, their justice, of course there were consequences, and I'm sure money wrote on the outcome, but in the Clinton and Jones case. It's the same case, kind of thing. Is it's it? I mean, the, the Clinton and Jones case, the, the consequences same. turned out to be 
epochal, and you were the only justice who at least hinted in your opinion that things could go terribly wrong. Actually, I think you said things could go badly, and arguably you pulled a punch. You had only been on the court for a relatively short time. It's possible. It's possible. But I, but I, well, I use my example because I want you to see the psychology mm -hmm. that I think is at play. And the psychology that's at play is try. I'll try to join this opinion to make the fifth vote. I know that's important, but I just can't. And I'm saying an aspect of that psychology is at work in, that, in a case where even now, I, but it's a much lesser degree. You see, I understand that the, 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 the press often writes, and it's quite true, it's five to four, five to four, and so if in fact we're nine to nothing in a case, I breathe a slight sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. Now, does that move me? Probably not. But there is this slight, it's uh, subtle, and oh well, whew, would I try a little harder? Yeah, I might try a little harder. But do I, can I try hard enough so it's really influencing the outcome? I get very nervous if it's really influencing the outcome. You see, because what's pulling the other way is don't say something you don't believe. Don't say something you don't believe. But don't be totally rigid. And so what is that line? Does it, seem, does it seem to you legitimate to self-consciously be more flexible when more votes would produce a better, as you put it, there, a better there are sense a lot of relief? Yeah, well, why, why I'm being slightly hesitant in, in, is you're trying to pin it down to a perfect example where it's the kind of thing that comes up a lot in a lot of different contexts. And Holmes said this pretty well. He said there are certain things you can't help, and if it reaches the can't help stage, you're going to write even if it's you alone. And if it's not at the can't help stage, then there are matters of degree, and at some point it will shade into something where if I'm standing for this completely, I'm obstructing what can be a, a, a more unanimous opinion. And greater unanimity is better than less. And, and you think quite often... Do you think a justice like you who believes in pragmatism would be more inclined to live with things than a justice like, say, Justice Scalia, who at least claims not know. to care very much don't about... No, no, you'd have to... You'd no you'd difference you're, in you're asking, practice. You're asking uh, me to be... Uh, my own uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, my wife is a psychologist, and she has plenty of work to do. <laughs> I mean, there it's a, I don't know on the answer to that. I, I do know that some of the most difficult uh, questions there is no treatise on. Uh, there is no set rule. Uh, what is the difference between unreasonable rigidity and giving in on something you shouldn't because you really believe it? Uh, what is, that's a big question, what is the way in which you write this opinion? To what level do you pitch it? If it's something that's going to be read by lots and lots of people, I better explain it in the clearest possible terms I can. You should always be clear, but be particularly clear if a lot of people are going to read this so they understand the reason and understand that you see the reasons on the other side. You see? And, uh, w w w uh, well, I'm just giving you some yeah. examples, but, but there, there, there's no answer to those kinds of things. I wanted there, to ask you about a very particular case where you did write a very clear yeah. opinion yeah. Um, in a case where consequences seemed to matter a great deal, and I want to ask you about that. And this was a case, it was called the Clapper decision, and it involved a lawsuit by essentially NGOs who believed that they were very likely to be being surveilled by the National Security Agency. And the Supreme Court, five to four, said they lacked standing to bring this suit because they couldn't prove injury in fact to su with sufficient specificity um, because they were speculating. They didn't know for certain that they were surveilled. They didn't know for certain that they were likely to be surveilled even. And you wrote a very strong and I think very clearly written dissent saying that's crazy. And I think the relevant fact, just to mention to the audience, is this all happened shortly before Edward Snowden's revelations. So you seemed, to me as an outside reader and to my students reading the case now, to have predicted much of the content of what Edward Snowden was then going to reveal to the public. I guess my question is, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I did not say, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, I, I did look up, and my law clerk looked up and got for me lots and lots of the statutes. So actually, many of the things that I read in the newspaper about these revelations, I said, I, 
I think they were public matters, at least they were argued in our court, and they were in my, the, the opinion that I wrote, and people could have found m many of them if they'd been interested. But uh, the, the, the point there was, uh, were these particular individuals who were suing likely to be hurt, they would be hurt if their conversations were overheard, if they were Americans. Now, a couple of them were uh, lawyers, uh, one of them anyway, and was a lawyer for people in Guantanamo. And so he had been <laughs> phoning people in Yemen <laughs> and other places, and uh, that was one of the places that I believe from what we, we were told they were surveying or surveilling or whatever the word is. You're giving it a French pronunciation. Survey, all right, surveilling, all right, whatever. And, and uh, there were some news people who were interested in human rights, and, and uh, they were interviewing people in these uh, Al-Qaeda groups, and I did think perhaps uh, they had been overheard. But I didn't say they were crazy. I just said, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. I said, well, if the government isn't listening to them, it isn't doing its job. <laughs> I mean, listening to the other side of the conversation. Uh, and so I thought it was likely that they were hurt, and I thought it was likely they had standing. And then uh, total coincidence, it turns out some time later, uh, there was uh, evidence. And, and I was right. But I mean, also, I have to admit, I've been wrong. I don't keep as good track as when I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, is it your view that that's that kind of guessing about the consequences or making a probabil probabilistic judgment? It's only a guess in Holmes' sense where he says it's an experiment, as all life is an experiment, you were making a probabilistic judgment yes. based on publicly available sources. That's right. You see that as a genuine and legitimate part of the job, I take Certainly, it. Certainly, you have to. I mean, of, of course there are instances where what, whether a person is, is likely to be hurt or not, uh, is a judge uh, has to make a decision. Uh, if he is likely to be hurt, he, he have standing. If not, he will not. That, judges do that every day of the week. They look at the evidence uh, and uh, they make judgments. Now, many times uh, it's juries who do that because they're finding the facts, but in certain instances uh, it's judges who will find the facts. Depends on the issue, depends on the case. So there's nothing surprising about that. How, how, job, part of how the job. aware are you, or do you think other justices might be, of what you might call defining social movements of a particular historical moment? Um, I mean, this would be interesting with respect to what you saw when you were a uh, a law clerk for Justice Goldberg, but it's also relevant in the contemporary environment where events in New York and in Ferguson um, have created substantial, I would say, and detailed and lengthy national discussion, national protest, national social and political reaction that's been, I, I think it's been generationally defining, certainly for a generation of, of students who are students right now, of my students. And I, they, they wonder, they ask, you know, how much do the justices notice and know and care about what's happening, as it were, out there in the world. What, what sort of an answer would you, would you give to I that? I think judges read newspapers, just like everybody else. When I worked for Justice Goldberg, I think for legal reasons, uh, namely Brown versus Board of Education, the court in 1964-65 was very, very interested in and in trying to carry out a particular task, which was to keep uh, going on uh, desegregation. Integration was a huge issue. But for the most part, uh, when I see an issue written about in the newspaper, uh, I know that if it comes to us, it will be briefed. And that is, we'll have a record, uh, we will have briefs on both sides. And I've learned over time that on particular matters, it is very dangerous to make up your mind or even to you know, sway one way or the other before you see those briefs. In the First Circuit, there was a famous case, a civil rights case, where everybody saw on television, I can't remember the name, it was from Watts. And while this is going on, I went down to the lunchroom and said, uh, well, what do you think? And my gosh, every one of the judges says, well, I, we're not, I don't know, I, I wasn't there, I'm not at the trial. That's a so judicial- This is the Rodney King case yeah, you're talking about? Yeah, that's a judicial attitude. You're trained to that. And I think it's a good thing, because I cannot tell you how often the world looks very different by the time I've read through the 10, or in a big case, 30 or 40 briefs, and looked at the record. Above all, above all, social movements or whatever, 
above all, what I'm trained to do and what I believe judges do do, and I believe that's a strength of the judiciary, is withhold judgment, look at the evidence, read the briefs, and then make up your mind. That's what we do, and that's what we should do. Now that makes perfect sense with respect to the particular facts of a case, mm -hmm. but does the same attitude hold or should it hold with respect to a broader social movement? If we're not talking about the particular events that took place that gave rise to this social movement, but rather the broader cultural and social attitude that says, for example, that argues on the one side that police are too quick to use force, um, and on the other, well, that, that police need to up. protect themselves that and ought to be yeah, cautious. Yeah, yeah. But th that, that one would come up in a particular case. It's pretty hard to see how it wouldn't come up in some particular factual case. The best, a good example, which you again are quite expert on, uh, of probably what you're talking about now, uh, is the change in the New Deal Court. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the New Deal Court uh, was, uh, when they decided these old cases, which were very much against the progressives, what they were doing is they were looking at words in that constitution and how they'd been interpreted for a hundred years. And uh, commerce meant that Congress had limited power in the area of commerce. And uh, liberty included liberty of contract. And then that just wasn't working for the country. It just wasn't working. And finally, uh, after a court packing, which I think most people are pleased failed, uh, new appointments came along. And new attitudes developed. And if I had to pick one, I would say the one that made the m most important difference was when Brandeis and others drew a pretty clear line between the attitudes of the court on economic and social matters, which should be very deferential towards the legislature, and attitudes on civil rights and personal liberty, where the court was defending, was. Uh, 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 to be more defensive, uh, sorry, to defend more directly the rights of individuals. So now that, that changed. So how, do the the judge, how does a judge go about this? How do you, just to be specific well, you to you? Don't, you don't have the opportunity for that. I mean, well, you, cases, do in, you do in epochal cases. No, sometimes. I mean, you don't feel, it's like being, you're in the midst of history. This is the key moment. No one knows that. It may turn out to be. It's true, but you I were mean, in the majority in, look, in if Lawrence, which reversed Bowers, which yeah, presented I, itself. Yeah, in the case, present, the opinion presents itself as a historical judgment. It says that Bowers was wrong yeah. the day it was decided. It's self-consciously echoing Brown. And I think it was wrong. Right. So the, I didn't have a problem with the, the, that case. I, th I thought that the, our overruling of the case was right. But it, but it didn't grew seem out to me as some great social movement. That's your job to write about how the great social movements influence the judges, and maybe they did. I'm just saying it doesn't feel that way. It does, but the place where it might turn up. You think it felt that way to Brandeis when you were describing I that shift? Know. I don't know. I'd say that's more your job than mine. And if where you're going is towards the gay rights case, I'm not. In April. I'm not going I there. am not going there. I'm not going there either. But if you want, I'm not going if, there if you want an you. example that I think will come up, but here I make dangerous making a prediction. I would say the key interesting case, which could turn out to be something, are the Guantanamo cases. Because there were four Guantanamo cases, mm -hmm. and in each of those four, the defendant, sorry, the, in, the incarcerated person, the detainee, mm -hmm. certainly not the most popular person in the United States. Ben yes. Laden's chauffeur was not the most popular. He was uh, not the most known either, but you're right that he was not very popular. He won. Yeah. All four won. Yeah. The most powerful people in the country, the President of the United States, lost. And a key sentence that Sandra O'Connor wrote that I think will turn out to be important is that the President, the Constitution does not write the President a blank check, where security on the one hand and civil liberties on the other clash. The Constitution gives Congress and the President the power to protect our security, and they must exercise it. It gives the courts greater power to protect individual civil liberties. So what happens when those two things clash? For a long time, the answer was either we won't tell you, which is called the political question doctrine mm -hmm. sometimes, 
or the president wins. For example, Korematsu, where we locked up 70,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. But what Sandra wrote in those cases is the Constitution does not write the president a blank check. Fine. And that immediately raises a question. Well, it doesn't write the president a blank check? Fine. What kind of check does it write? You see? Now, I say the answer to that kind of question is going to arise slowly, perhaps, out of other cases that come to the court. And my job as a judge is to try to get those cases right. And so then you can write an article saying how it was part of a social movement, that's all fine, <laughs> I, I don't mind. But I'm, I'm focusing on what I know and do during the day. Although you, you did it, I mean, interestingly, you, I mean, you, you were the one who said that justices are influenced by these things. I'm saying but your they point read is that you don't newspapers. think about it that way. I'm saying they read newspapers, which is true. I'm saying, unlike popular belief, judges, maybe I shouldn't say this, but they actually are human beings. <laughs> I mean, not everyone believes. Lawyers are too, by the way. <laughs> but, That's but, more uh, doubtful. Yes. You know. No, no. Uh, they, but but uh, 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 of, of course. But when you're deciding that case, and Tony Kennedy mm -hmm. put this very well, very well. It's so true, and no, but judges, I'm not saying judges are good, bad, or indifferent, but, I, but I'm saying that's, it's the nature of the job. He's talking to a group of Russian judges, and they're talking about judicial independence. And he said to them, so true, there is no one who knows whether you are deciding independently, but for one person, yourself. You are the only one who will know. Because the lawyers, the ones you decide for, say it's wonderful. The ones who lost, terrible. Were you true to the record? They may say yes or no, but no one will believe them. The press, fine. It's nice to say X was brave, says the editorial. It would be brave to have them say he's not brave. I mean, really. I mean, so the one person who knows is you, and it is a lonely job. Now, that, that's pretty descriptive, and that's what we think we're doing. So the reference both to uh, foreign uh, judges and to loneliness uh, leads me in the direction of asking you a question about a, a space of social contact for you, um, and then I'll turn to the public's questions. And that is uh, your long-term engagement with France, not only its railway tariff laws, with which you're clearly conversant, uh, the turtle variety or the snail variety, but also, uh, more broadly, French politics, law and culture. You're uh, um, one of the only Americans to be elected uh, and one of the very few foreigners to be elected a member of the Académie des Sciences uh, Morales et Politiques, which is an extraordinary uh, distinction for, for anybody. And you've had a sustained engagement with French thought over many, many years. In, in the French system, the Conseil Constitutionnel operates very differently than our Supreme Court, among other things, because it gets to look at laws before they become law. And I wanted to ask you, in your contact with French lawyers and, and judges, are you, what do you think about that? Are you full of longing for a system where the justices could avoid some of the worst practical difficulties by getting to weigh in on a law before it came to be so? Or are you, obviously, we've got our system. I'm not asking you to alter that. But do you sometimes think to yourself that would be a, a better system to have? No. I mean, they're actually moving towards our system. <laughs> and uh, they're reviewing laws after. I think the virtue of knowing a foreign language or, or trying to know something about France is the same uh, for uh, uh, any student, particularly uh, in college or any human being who takes the time uh, to learn something about history or literature. And when I'm talking to the undergrads, I say, you want to know what to study to become a lawyer? Don't study law. You'll get that in law school. You have one life. And the one you know best is your own. And maybe you know your life of your wife or family, but not many others. But if you speak a foreign language and you put your time in, if you probably learn through literature what's going on elsewhere, you can know other people. I mean, there are very few people whom we know as well as we know Anna Karenina. And she never even lived. <laughs> and and uh, uh, so I say, the you, you, you want to know something about the world. And for a judge? A judge, an appellate judge, whom I've just, it's not a complaint, but I'm saying you do spend an awful lot of time in that room with the computer and the books. 
And the things that you write will affect other people. And if you don't have enough imagination to figure out how and what that means, you're in trouble. And so it's not a bad idea at all to study humanities. It may be a little out of date. But my goodness, I think that's the value I've gotten. When I say I've, I've, I've read some French, it's because it opens a window on a different way of thinking and a different civilization and a different kind of approach to things. Fine. I've learned something about other people, and there are millions of ways you can learn it, and there are hundreds of languages. You speak about six Arabic languages. My just, guess, just the one. All right. But anyway, it gives you some insight. It gives you some insight into how other people are thinking, and, and that I think is a big plus, and I think I've benefited from it, and I'd, I hope that the uh, undergraduates uh, will continue to benefit from it. Um, I want to turn to audience questions now. I will edit only insofar as I will omit questions that take the form of, this is an actual question, do you feel Chevron doctrine should be applied in King against Burwell? We're not asking that question. Um, <laughs> here's a, a more generic question. Um, could you say something about the dynamics of conference? Mm -hmm. um, are, is there a freewheeling discussion the questioner wants to know? Are the justices more circumspect? Um, or more broadly, what could you tell us about the way conference operates? It's about as private a political institution as exists in North America. I can tell you everything about it. The, great. There's nothing. <laughs> well, maybe great. I mean, uh, we hear the, we read the briefs. I've usually read the briefs. We, we hear oral argument in two week sessions, the first two weeks of October, November, December, January, last two weeks of February, March, April. Um, I've usually read that there are usually 12, 10 to 12 uh, arguments during those two week periods, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, this is, follows a routine. I've read the um, briefs usually be for all 10 or 11 or so before uh, the beginning of the week. I've then divided them among my four law clerks and they've each read three sets and then we discuss them and I have them write a memo on A, B, and C, and whatever else you want. So before the oral argument, I have, uh, uh, I'll read the memo, I'll have at least one conversation, sometimes two, and everybody does something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we have our oral argument, and the oral argument is just a nightmare for the lawyers. I mean, you have the nine of us sitting there, and, and we think that the oral argument's for us to ask questions, not for the lawyer to make his argument. We have heard the argument in the briefs, at least we've read it, or at least we think we have. And, and uh, why say something new? Why didn't you put it in the brief? And if it's in the brief, why don't we know it already? Well, sometimes we might not, but nonetheless, very tough for the lawyer. Because we ask questions, give them very little time, and one judge will be nodding like this and the other will be frowning. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy. But after that oral argument, after the briefs, on Wednesday afternoon for Monday's cases, on Friday morning for Tuesdays and Wednesdays, four cases, we're in our conference room, sitting at a table about maybe from between the curtains here, nine of us, no one else in the room. And the ch we each have a book, and in each book is each, a different book for each case or half the book for each case, and it has everybody's name on it with a space to write, because each of us writes down what the other says. Because after all, if I have to write the opinion, I better know what you're thinking about it. Right, so uh, the Chief Justice begins, and he says the case is da da da, and this is what I think about it. Uh, and he, it's, it's succinct, five minutes, ten minutes maybe. But he gives reasons that he has for, and then he says, so I would affirm it or I would reverse it. It's all tentative, but it fairly sticks to what people, it's close. So it goes then to Justice Scalia, uh, and then uh, Justice Kennedy, Justice Thomas, Justice Ginsburg, me, Alito, uh, Sotomayor, Kagan. And each of us says what we think. And then there is some back and forth. Not too much. It's not who has the best argument. If I, I mean, arguments, you know, there are millions of them. I think, oh, I have a great argument. If you disagree with it, you think, no, I have a better argument. You could go on indefinitely. That's not the point of it. The point of it is to say what's actually moving you at that moment as you come to a tentative decision on this case. And it wouldn't work otherwise. 
So I'm listening to what other people are saying. And if I have something that I think can contribute to your thought, I might say it. And I have a better chance of convincing you if I'm attuned to what you're thinking. And otherwise I have zero chance. And I have to be open to being convinced too. Because if I'm not, people will sense that pretty quickly and think the whole thing's some kind of a trick and not a discussion. So, the social discussion. so then the social incentives and the logic of the moment mm -hmm. are such that there's no, you don't go on at great length, but there's also no reason not to be fully candid about what's Correct. moving you. Correct. And then at the end of the discussion... Everyone will know soon enough anyway, because you're, you're getting there. Yeah, at the end of the, of the, of the conference, we have a, a tent, you can see from what people have said, where they're leaning, and at the end of the two weeks, uh, the Chief Justice, if he's in the majority, uh, or whoever is senior in the majority, assigns the opinions to be written. But there are constraints. Everybody writes one opinion before anybody writes two. And everyone's assigned two before anybody's assigned three. And then there are certain constraints by the need to try to get the five votes. So those are all, those constraints are all discretionary on the Chief Justice. That's correct. It's become sort of, has that become, in your sense, sufficiently normalized that it would be very strange if there were any deviation from it? Correct. It wouldn't happen. And I mean, I, you never can say, I mean, very unlikely to happen. And Chief Justice Rehnquist followed the same practice. Yes, exactly. So then if it's assigned to me, I will go back and I'll talk to my clerk who worked on it and say I want a, a, a draft or a memo, whatever, but it's, I want all these things in it. Put in whatever you think, but I want the, the arguments and so forth. Have but you seen justices be moved away yeah. from their positions in conference? Yes, yes. Have you ever been moved away yes. from your in conference? Yeah. Yes. I mean, people are, they're moved by oral people think, the law clerks all think that we never change our mind, but they can't see inside our minds. Well, that, no, so, it's not it, strictly speaking true. They think that they changed your mind. Oh, well, there's a lot to that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's probably right. That may be pure yeah. fantasy on their part, but that is certainly the nature of their fantasy. Yes. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, but uh, that's interesting. But or, oral argument, it's, it's the or, oral argument, it does change views a lot. If it doesn't change from A to B, it shapes often how you see the case. And that's true of conference, too. Sometimes it moves somebody from A to B, you know, or A to not A. But more often, it, 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 it shapes your view of the case. And do you think that's you, the other justices talking in conference, or the lawyers, or it could be either? No, oh, certainly the lawyers help in their, in, in their, in their briefs, and that has an enormous impact. But the, the judges in the conference can do the same. Yeah. I didn't see it that way. Oh. I see how you're good. Nah, and you think about it. Because if I'm writing, I have two or three or four weeks to get that draft. I'll take my law clerk's draft and take the briefs and go back and write at the word processor, give it back to her, and she th then thinks hers is better, but nonetheless. Uh, and then, then uh, I get another one, and then I sit back at my word processor, and it usually is you know, two from scratch and back and forth, and eventually we get something that we circulate, and hope that I pick up at least five. And people can write dissents or they can write concurrences. Eventually everybody's written or joined, and that's it. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty simple, the process. Not some, uh, the judge, you know, in Congress, obviously there is something interesting in what goes behind the scenes. Behind the scenes must be there because the output is a statute that may tell you what to do or what not to do or what you can do or what you can't do. But it doesn't tell you why. You, but a judge's should, decision tells you why, right in the decision. Do you think in that process of getting the joins, that consciously or unconsciously, it might depend on the person, there's some thought to the question of how alliances will look in this case or another case? Nothing so crude as a log roll, but awareness that if I align myself with this justice in this case, where it's, the case is going this way, that in the long run it might be of Value? You think that's, does that happen consciously or unconsciously? <coughs> Two rules, and Sandra explained them, the second one to me, which I think are very beneficial. The first rule is no one speaks twice in conference until everyone has spoken once. That's a great rule for any small group because everybody feels that he's had a chance to be heard. Second rule, tomorrow is another day. We might have been the greatest of allies in case one, but we're totally at opposite ends on case two. No carryover. You were with me on case one, fine, but you're not on case two. And there we are. Each case is independent. 
each case. Now, people may end up on the same side because they have somewhat similar views. That isn't surprising. But for the simple reason that you decided with me here, I'll decide with you there, no. That's a mori of the institution, no. So the next question is very uh, appropriate at the Y, 92nd Street Y, which has a um, Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. And the question has to do with religious influences. Um, you spoke about political or ideological, a better word is probably ideological or jurisprudential perspectives that justices have. Um, might their religious backgrounds uh, play a role in the shaping of that jurisprudential or ideological position? And I will add to the questioner that if we were to look at this current court um, on what's usually considered the liberal end of the court, there are uh, three women, all of them from New York, um, one from Queens, sorry, one from Brooklyn, one from the Bronx, one from Manhattan, two Jewish, one Latina, and then there's, uh, there's you, you're from, the, uh, you're, you're from the Bay Area, as you, as you admitted yourself, as it were. Um, then on the other side, um, broadly speaking, there are four white and one African-American men, each is a Catholic, um, and perhaps religious background in some sense, not in a crude sense, but allied with demographics and other political preferences might play a role in the shaping of ideology. Might. <laughs> <laughs> but no, what I think is interesting there, and, and this is a really a good question for the appointing authorities, I think that fact shows that America has changed, and maybe for the better, that there isn't the same political balance or the desire. I mean, it's on this spectrum. When I was appointed, it was the year after Ruth Ginsburg was appointed. And after I was confirmed, I went back up to Boston and Senator Kennedy, whom I worked for, uh, was on the plane. And we got off, and as we walked down the gangway there, a young woman who was a reporter for a Jewish newspaper came up. And she said, how do you feel about two Jews being on the court at the same time? And my response, because it was Kennedy's response too, and he was sort of, he, he didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> it might have made him a little nervous, I don't know. But my response was exactly his, even though the question was directed to me, and it's what I said, just like this, fine, fine. You see, I feel that pretty strongly. When there are African Americans on the court and people's response is, fine, fine, whoever it is. Fine. Then everyone knows that I'm Jewish, that he's African American, and so, and you really mean it. Fine. Fine. <laughs> Just like that. And then some obstacles that have been posed in this country to Jews and to Catholics, and certainly to African Americans. Yes. Those obstacles will have fallen on the day that people throughout the country can say to a question like that, fine, just like that. That's what I think about them being, uh, the, you know, the, the ethnicity on the court and so forth. So it follows from you that. You see what I mean? Yeah, sure. I, it, okay. That sounds like a strong moral stand to take. Um, and I take it that it follows from that that the configuration of the court that even if the configuration of the court mattered on these points, even if you thought that religious background or ethnicity had some impact, the morally right thing to do, at least from your perspective, would be to insist that it ought not to matter. I don't think it does matter. I mean, who knows what goes into the great mix that, that uh, 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 ends up with an interpretation of the word liberty in the 14th Amendment. Well, I just, just said I mean, Lowell High School probably plays a big role maybe more than Temple Emanuel, I don't know. <laughs> but but the, 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 the fact is none of us knows, and what people try to do is they try to get the interpretation of these words right. Well, Justice Frankfurter, for example, yeah. sa said in one of his most famous uh, dissents, he began by saying, essentially identifying as a Jew, and then said, and that's totally irrelevant to my opinion. He essentially said, I've bent over backwards to avoid allowing religious ethnicity, uh, religion or ethnicity to affect me. And he said, you know, as, Jew, as judges, we are neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Protestant nor Catholic. For him, that was a kind of statement of faith in American identity rather than distinctively Jewish identity. Is that the sort of thing 
that you have in mind that even if one no, felt it I have enough, in or you mind, just think it's really I, not I relevant? have in mind a world where people won't feel compelled to say that mm -hmm. because they'll live it. Mm -hmm. And when they live it and don't have to say it, then I think that's an advance. And as far as the accord is concerned, I really do think uh, that uh, uh, religion uh, doesn't play much of a role, if any, it is part of a person's background. One questioner asks, if you could single-handedly amend the Constitution, <laughs> what would your amendment say? No one has asked me to amend the Constitution. <laughs> yeah. It's a hypothetical. It's you ask about the risky. judge. The, the lawyers are asked risky. that all the time by you. It's very risky to amend the Constitution, I would say, because uh, I remember, don't you remember that there were all these suggestions for a convention? And uh, my, my, my father was uh, in San Francisco in the 30s. They had a charter convention, and they provided that 40 years later they'd have another to write the city charter. And for some reason or other, my father got uh, elected to that. And he said all they did was get in there and argue, and luckily nothing came out. I mean, I'd be worried about what came out of that convention if we had one. That's a very Madisonian view. Jefferson, on the other hand, always wanted more conventions because he thought otherwise we're ruled by the dead hand of the past, mm -hmm. so we should dig right in and express our own distinctive views. Wouldn't that be active liberty of the kind that you've championed over the years, to be an active participant in the shaping of our most fundamental political values rather than receiving that which we've gotten from long dead ancestors? <laughs> well, you understand my answer to that. My answer is I do not think a constitutional convention is a good idea, and I'm very nervous about constitutional <laughs> amendments, and uh, there we are. Okay. Um, one person who's a law student wonders what you think of the direction of your old academic field, administrative law. Do you see any major trends in its development? Do you see a, a big picture about how the field looks relative to when you were last teaching the, the field? Not, 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 I don't think there's, I don't know of too many tremendous changes in this area. I will say I'm glad he's an administrative law student. Uh, there, I, I loved administrative law, but there were only like a handful of us who <laughs> saw the virtue of that subject. Uh, the uh, uh, thing I do said, have said sometimes is, is that if I could just pick out one rule of law uh, for uh, uh, some of the uh, develop, well, like Russia, when it, when it, when it uh, changed, uh, uh, one, one pretty good principle is a principle of administrative law. And that's a simple principle. If the thing isn't public, it isn't a law. That helps with a rule of law. It means they can't arrest you or throw you in jail and say, I'll arrest you now and tell you why later. So I've suggested uh, administrative. That you see, it works in places sometimes a very interesting uh, uh, area to, to, if you have the chance to talk to about these places, China. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you might suggest a few things that don't sound too threatening, yeah. but that they might actually do. And one of them are principles of administrative law, keep things open, another no ex parte communications, and uh, you know, et cetera. Yeah, which are not that great if your goal is to maintain centralized control over judges. Yeah. Um, this is a question I know you've been asked many times before, but it's a question that remains a pressing one from the standpoint of the media, and that is, should Supreme Court arguments be televised? As, as you know, my old boss, Justice Souter, used to say that that would hope happen over, they would bring in the cameras over his cold, dead body, um, but he's resigned, so that wouldn't be necessary. Um, what, what's, your, what's your view on the, maybe let me rephrase the question. Is there a right time for that to happen? I think eventually it'll happen, I mean, because the generation will, grow up who doesn't, uh, they can't imagine why there isn't television. Well, I think that generation is probably here already. Well, they're not on the court yet. <laughs> <laughs> so they will be. And there aren't five of them on the court. No, I, I will, it might, well, all right. But <laughs> leaving that aside, it's very easy for people to see the arguments for doing it. After all, television's every other place. The arguments against it are harder to see, but they're nonetheless real. One of them is that we're a symbol, and if in fact we had television in the court, uh, it would be everywhere, and I'd worry about it in criminal trials, in respect to witnesses, in respect to jurors, in respect to intimidation, in respect, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, a second reason um, um, is people don't understand really how we run, how, how, how the court runs. 
And one good thing about human beings is they identify with other human beings, and the person seen is more easily identified with than the person not seen. And the person seen on television is more easily identified with than the person written about on a column. Uh, but in the court, our job is to deal with rules of law and interpretations that may affect millions of people who are not in that courtroom. And we have to have that in our mind. We have to. And the merits of this particular individual or client versus the other is often submerged and less important. What about the well, but I'll give you the real reason, Please. which I haven't come to. Sorry. It's all right. I'm going on too long on this, but the, the, the real reason, or the most important, I think, is this. Uh, and many of the journalists have told us this. So we wouldn't be affected. It wouldn't affect us personally. We have the journalists there anyway who watch a little bit what we say, but not too much. You wait and see what happens the first time you see yourself on television depicted in a way that is totally unfair and gives the impression that if you're not Torquemada, you're just the opposite of whatever you thought you were saying. The sound bias. The second time that that happens, you will watch yourself and you will be careful what you say. And we're not too careful. Now, is that true? I'm not sure. It might be. But we're a conservative lot when it comes to preserving the court. I mean, we didn't invent this institution. We're there as temporary caretakers. And it is an institution that by and large has served the country well. And the worst thing that could happen to any of us personally is to do something that then seriously hurt the reputation of the court. And we well, all know that. And as long as that's a concern, it's, you know, there, there, there is a big problem. Or do you think that you are, are you affected, are your colleagues affected by the, I think, totally genuine and legitimate concern that being on television would change your individual lives and not for the better? That you would, it would be much harder to walk down the street without being accosted, annoyed? I'll get over it. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't think that's a big problem. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> I were not recognized that much. I mean, I, say, you should, I told you that, didn't I? People, I get asked this question, don't people recognize you? No, not usually. In Washington? No, not usually. In a restaurant? Well, sometimes. If they do recognize me, they come up and always ask the same question, what's that? I say, well, aren't you just a suitor? <laughs> no, that, that's basically. I mean, that might... I won't ask you if you're going to see the play about Justice Scalia that's opening in Washington, D.C. now, um, or the Scalia-Ginsburg opera, which is also uh, apparently in the cards. Um, I heard some of that. It was rather good, actually. Oh, good. It's a kind of, pa it's, a, it's, 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 it's nice. Um, it's a, co a comic opera, I'm assured. No, it's, the music's nice. It's just um, so we, we've got time maybe for, for one more question, or maybe just perhaps two, but I, this one is a quirky one, and I thought it's worth asking you. What was the strangest case you've ever had before you, Fisher exempted? I'm just trying to debate whether I should tell the truth. <laughs> Please do. Your mother said I to think tell it's the, the truth. the strangest thing I ever said. And I've said some pretty strange things from that bench. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had a case. Well, why are these things? You see, well, this is an argument against television. Sometimes something pops into my head. <laughs> we had a case that involved whether you could, have, you could trademark a color. The trademark is supposed to represent the origin of the thing that has the mark on it. Could a color be a trademark? And it was a, a group of uh, um, people who sold dry cleaning pads primarily to con Korean dry cleaners who didn't read much English, and he dyed them a bilious shade of yellow green. And he wanted that to be the trademark. And could you do it? And so I was trying to think, why, why am I telling you this? I, it's a, I don't look very good in this story. But, but in, any, in any case, um, um, I was trying to think of an example, because you, a trademark is not supposed to have a function. You see, if it has a function, you, you can't use it as a trademark. It has to be something without a function. And so we were on the subject of could you have a shape as a trademark, like a Coca-Cola bottle. So while we're doing that, I suddenly popped into my head, I asked the lawyer, well, uh, suppose 
that you have, were trying to trademark a um, bottle of whiskey in the shape of a comb. He said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I went on to something else. Well, well, you see, uh, all right, forget it. That's one of the weirder things that's happened to me on the court, and I brought it on myself. And have you contemplated subsequently what the meaning was of I wrote the, the, opinion the cone-shaped the bottle of whiskey, though? No, no, forget it. <laughs> um, one more question from the audience, and then my own last question. Um, this is a question from the audience. To what do you attribute the partisanship that seems to be visible in the nation as a whole? Do you have a view about what's brought it about, or perhaps you think that it's not as intense as we imagine it to be relative to the past? I don't know. I, I have much, not much light to shed on it. I've read uh, some things that interested me. I, there was a book that came out in 2008. I can't remember who the author now, but he did a lot of graphs work, and he showed the, the polarizing in the House of Representatives. So there were the, whereas usually there was a dispersion like that, it's now two dispersions around this, which it shows polarization. And people think, well, it's gerrymandering. I, I wrote a dissent in a case where I thought we should look at gerrymandering more closely. Political than gerrymandering Yeah, in political particular. gerrymandering, yeah. right. But then it's the same in the Senate. And you can't gerrymander the Senate. And the other thing he wrote, and he looked back to 1970 in making the comparison, is you take a map of the country and uh, he colored in by county, which is not a congressional district. He colored either red or blue those counties where more than 60% voted Dem or voted Rep. And if you looked in the 70s, you could hardly see any color. If you looked in 2008, filled with color. And that meant people are moving near people who think the same way as they do politically. Mm -hmm. And I read somewhere that the 2012 election was the first one in which more than a majority came from such counties. Now, that may be a problem. I see that. What to do about it? I don't know. But if I'm talking to the law school students and so forth, I say, if you want to know, and this is true of my own confirmation, you want to know why people in Congress do what they do? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Eventually, since I have confidence in this, I think people in Congress will do what their constituents want. And eventually, this is corny, but I think eventually uh, constituents will want them to pull together. And when constituents want them to pull together more than they want them to be separated, lo and behold, they will. And that's because they're elected. If I can remind you, we are talking about a document. And the first seven parts of this document provide for a system where those who make the laws in the Congress are directly responsible to the people. And so I think it's the people that have to be convinced that this is the kind of government they want because the structure that Madison, your friend, created permits and foresees that. So this, this is my own last question, and it's, it's this. How do you conceive your role as a judge in relation to those people who are out there? Are you there, I mean, I, I don't want to fill it in, but are you there, I, we can imagine different images. They're faithful agent, a person who's trying to help them see the commitments that no, they've made themselves. I'm not none their the representative. Above. I'm none of the above. So how I do mean, you, that's the what amazing is, What thing. is your obligation the to them, if what any? I'm what, I, what I'm trying to say, say when, when I'm in my office the two or three years ago, but it's so typical of many conversations that, that I've had with uh, people who are judges in Africa, Asia, other parts of the world, Latin America. Woman, she's the uh, president of the court in Ghana, and she's trying to um, create or help to create or maintain greater democracy and, and human rights and a degree of equality, just those things that I think are in this Constitution. And she says, how do you do it? What's the secret? I said, there's no secret. It's history. It's history, but you have to convince people who are not lawyers and who are not judges 
contrary to popular belief, 309 million of the 310 million Americans are not lawyers. <laughs> but they're the ones who have to understand that it is in their interest to have a rule of law. And a rule of law means that some of the time the judges will decide things that are very important to you. And they hurt you the way they're decided. And moreover, the judges being human might be wrong. Indeed, if it's 5-4, somebody's wrong. All right? Now, are you prepared to accept that? Are you prepared to accept a system called a rule of law where you will sometimes lose and sometimes wrongly lose and sometimes be hurt by losing? When you are prepared, then Maybe you'll get it. And I heard Harry Reid say that, almost in those words, about Bush v. Gore, where he said the most remarkable thing about it is never remarked, which is that no shooting in the street, no riots, no, and I go to a college campus, they say, too bad there weren't more. Uh, but, but I say, before you think that, go turn on the television set and see how people decide things in countries that decide them through the riots. And Harry, Reed says, well, that's one of our greatest, greatest, greatest treasures. Now, that rule of law, which means the opposite of the arbitrary, the despotic, the tyrannical. Yes. That means the opposite. What I am? I'm one of the cogs. I'm one of the wheels. I'm one of the many people who are part of that great machine. And it's that machine with people deciding independently that makes it possible, even though those people are sometimes wrong, to have a rule of law in America, which I think helps to hold those 310 million different people together. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I'm so proud, of, if I'm proud of anything, I'm proud of being part of that as just as every American is. I want to thank you, Justice Breyer, not only for your extraordinary service uh, as much more than just any old cog in that extraordinary machine, but also for spending the evening with us and helping us understand more about how you think about the rule of law. Thank you so much. <laughs>